Hello, and welcome back to uh, Ethics. I want to talk about deontology today, and as always, I want to give a, an overview of uh, where we're at in, in the ethics course. So again, um, as a larger kind of overview, there's three different types of ethics that we uh, talk about in this course. Uh, Metaethics is, again, the kind of foundational beliefs in, in ethics. It deals with the nature of goodness and what we mean by uh, good and evil, if it even exists. Um, there is where we're at right now, normative ethics, which deals with the conflicts of, uh, of interest, um, conflicting moral beliefs and, and how to settle problems between people. And then there is what we will deal with at the end of the semester, uh, applied ethics, right? And that takes into consideration the, the theories that we learn in both normative and, and metaethics and uh, applies that to, to real world situations. So right now in normative ethics, we've talked about a couple of different things. Um, we've talked about agency-based ethics, which again are uh, focusing on the, the individuals and, and the people who uh, are, are in a situation. There is what we'll be talking about today, action-based uh, ethics, which is deontology. And of course, what we looked at at the beginning part of the semester, the idea of consequentialism. And I want to point out that sometimes you can divide ethics just into uh, consequentialism and non-consequentialism. And non-consequentialism would obviously be all of the, the theories that are agency and action based and consequentialist theories or consequentialism is obviously everything that falls under, under consequentialism. So today we are focusing not on agency based ethics and not on <laughs> consequentialism, but of course action based ethics. In looking at deontological ethics um, or action-based ethics, you might wonder at the beginning um, what makes this different from the other approaches that we've been looking at. Probably the biggest difference between deontology and anything else that we are looking at this semester is that the ethics themselves are based entirely on the action and they have absolutely nothing to do with the results of that action. Um, there is um, a complete detachment um, from, from the results and um, mostly there is a focus on either some type of ruling standard um, about the, the action itself um, or more commonly um, the, the actions um, are, are specified by a particular duty to perform a, a, a type of action. And that is the, the basis for deont deontological ethics. One of the primary arguments that we could talk about um, for deontological ethics comes from this idea of what's called the principle of moral uncertainty. Um, which just simply says you you do not know what your actions are are going to produce. Let's say, for instance, that you went hiking uh, one day and that you came across somebody who was distressed, and you basically kind of had two different choices. You could uh, take the the person who was in distress, um, you know, carry them to your car um, and and drive them to the hospital, or you could call an ambulance and, and wait for uh, someone to it to arrive and take the person to the hospital. And there's a number of different results that could come from that. Um, you know, you could take the person to the hospital in your car and that could lead to them getting better. Um, you could, because you took them in your car, um, <laughs> right, uh, ultimately uh, discover something along the lines of that um, you know, they they weren't really in distress and, um, you know, they want to get out of your car. Something bad's going to happen if they don't, right, kind of feeling, right? Um, you, you could have discovered as you put them in their car, in your car, that, um, you know, everything's actually okay. And, um, you know, they, they don't even need to go to the hospital. 
um, because maybe you waited for an ambulance, maybe the person died and you should have taken them to your car. Maybe by taking them to their car, they didn't get the medical care that they needed from an ambulance. And so by taking them in your car, um, they actually died as a result of you not waiting on an ambulance. Um, you can probably think in your own mind of all these different scenarios, all these different situations where a different action could lead to a different result. But the thing is, is that you don't actually control those results. You only control your actions. And the reason why people in deontological ethics want to focus on the actions is because if we're not able to control the results of our actions, we don't know what the action itself is going to produce, um, we have to have a way in which we can still be justified in what it is that we do. And so looking at ethics from a deontological perspective, um, there's really this kind of idea that that morality itself is, is a much more objective um, sort of uh, thing, that um, just the same way as, um, you know, one plus one equals two, no matter where you are in the world, um, you should be able to perform a action that is good, no matter what the context is, no matter ultimately what, what the result ends up being. And so, in thinking about this particular uh, train of thought, um, Kant starts off by describing um, what he says is the goodwill. And when he's thinking about the goodwill, he points out the fact that if we will something um, that is good, that is, if it is the goodwill, it has to be good not because of what it achieves, um, that is, what the result of the action is, um, but because of what it actually is. That's the meaning behind calling something good, is that it is in a state of goodness. Its very being is good. And so if so the goodwill, as he describes it, is in fact good, it has to be good because it already is good. If this is true, that the goodwill is good not because of what it achieves, but because of what it is, then there's a second thing that follows from this. And that is, if we strive to do something because it is good, then we have to strive not only to want to achieve that thing, but to achieve the things that allow us to achieve that thing. And so um, a simple way of putting this uh, from Kant's perspective is to say that willing the end to do something is also willing the means to that end. So for instance, if I want to go out and get some milk for my children, I have to also will the means to either walk myself to the store and pick up the milk and walk myself back, or I have to will the means for me to go into the car, which is a much more likely scenario, and drive to the store and then bring that milk back. But I have to do something in order to achieve that end. And that's the same point that Kant is making, is that if we will to do something, we not only have to be able to will that thing, but all of the actions that require us to reach that end. And so thinking about this, there's really two different types of, of um, ends that uh, Kant talks about. And, and these ends are called in imperatives. Um, and really the, the first category of, of ideas that he uses is what he calls hypothetical imperatives. Um, these are um, imperatives that you do because it's something that you want to achieve. So a classic kind of example of this is if you want to lose weight, you have to diet and exercise. Um, in order to be able to achieve that end of, of losing weight, um, you have to do the things that are required, right? Dieting and, and exercising. Um, I think the example you're reading gives you is that like if you want to go to the movies um, you have to uh, will to to drive there and also to to purchase the, the tickets um, to be able to go see it um, again those those are things that you have to do if you want to achieve them what makes them hypothetical is the fact that you you don't have to want to achieve those 
Um, you can choose not to go to the movie theaters. You can choose not to lose weight. Um, those, again, are, are all things that you're, you're striving to do um, hypothetically. The main distinction that Kant makes in morality is what's called the categorical imperative. And what makes this different than a hypothetical imperative is that it's something that is required for you to do. And what Kant points out is that we all have different duties based on our roles in society. So your duties as a student are different than your, your duties as a worker. Um, your duties as a uh, you know, son or daughter are, are different than your duties as a, a father or mother or something along those lines. Um, so within our society, we have different roles ourselves. But Kant takes this to kind of a, a higher category of talking about, well, what about what it means for us to be human beings? Right? Are there things that we have to do just simply because we have a duty as human beings to act in a certain manner? So I want you to consider this scenario for just a moment. Um, imagine that there is a, a person who's, who's kind of like a stalker and um, they follow somebody every single uh, day and they determine that they're going to, to break into that person's car and steal everything that they have. And so as they keep following them right throughout the week, they determine that on a particular Friday, they're going to break into a person's car and uh, steal all of that money. And lo and behold, um, they go up to the person's window, they smash out the window, and right as they smash out the window, they see this in the car. Um, if we think about that for a moment, we could, could realize that on one end, the person smashing out the window um, is actually a, a good thing because the person who they were stalking um, accidentally left their toddler um, in, in the car. And, you know, this is something that, that happens, um, you know, not super frequently, but, um, you know, there's usually a couple occurrences um, a, a year in, in the summer, and you hear kind of tragic stories about this happening. Um, so in light of those facts, you could look at that and say, well, the person that was stalking this individual and broke their window, they did a really good thing because they made sure that this particular toddler didn't die. But if we look at the intention behind breaking the, the car window, the intention wasn't to save this toddler. It was to rob the individual. And Kant points out that our intentions are actually the beginning of our moral actions. Um, we need the right intention to perform the right moral action. And so even if we do something that ends with a good consequence, in this case that the toddler is saved because the window is broken, that doesn't mean that the action itself is good. Um, our t intentions, this is a distinction that's made in philosophy all the time, our intentions are a necessary condition but not a sufficient condition for a proper moral action. That means that we have to have the right intention, but having the right intention isn't enough to perform a moral action. And uh, total Kant has four standards that we have to abide by in order to perform the right moral action. And so it always begins with our intentions. So when we are thinking about the categorical imperative, um, we have to ask that question to start off with. Do I have the right intention? Um, if you don't have the right intention, then obviously you're not gonna perform the, the right moral action. The second standard that Kant uh, sets out is what's sometimes referred to as the contradiction and conception test. Sometimes this is also called the universalizability principle. And um, what he states is uh, just simply this, act on that maximum that you can will as a universal law. Now, if you look at that, you, you might be taken back right, by that word maximum, <laughs> right? And wondering like, what, what does this actually mean? Um, but it's not really as complicated as the wording may, may point out. 
Um, and really, in thinking about this, there's really only one major thing that you have to think about. And this thing is whether or not what you are going to do uh, ultimately erodes the notion that it implies. So, as an example, um, if you want to steal something, um, stealing implies the notion of ownership. And what Kant would point out is if uh, you steal, then that withers away to some degree the notion of ownership. Um, and in fact, if everybody stole, there would be no notion of ownership left because people would steal whenever they wanted to. So if what you're doing is something that could be universalized, right? Or I should say could not be universalized because it takes away from the notion that it implies. That is, if every single person, when they wanted to steal, stole, there would no, no longer be a notion of ownership, then the action itself is contradictory. It contradicts its own conception. Um, because again, the only thing that makes stealing possible is the fact that people own things to begin with. And so if we did that to a universal level where everyone stole when they wanted to, it would completely destroy its own conception. Let's look at another idea really quick here. Uh, cheating, Kant points out, right, erodes the notion of fidelity. Um, for instance, uh, if you um, wanted to um, take the, this notion of fidelity and the, the other direction for, for a moment, right? Um, if, if you wanted to, to cheat on a test, let's say, right? And um, everybody else didn't cheat on the test. Um, you, you could get away with that. But if every person, it was just a given that every person was going to cheat on their test, um, it would no longer make the test meaningful uh, for, for anybody. Um, in fact, if all tests were just, you know, everyone just fills in <laughs> right, the, the right answers um, with, without knowing anything, then, then the whole notion of, of taking the test to begin with doesn't make sense. Um, if we take notion, the notion of cheating in the other direction, right, as far as like relationships are concerned, and that, you know, you, you have no commitment to anybody. Uh, whenever you want to cheat on them, you can, you can cheat on them. Um, again, that uh, points out the fact that, that the notion of fidelity that, that you have for the relationship itself um, ultimately doesn't really mean anything because whenever you feel like not being faithful in that relationship, you won't be. Um, another example that's probably the easiest to kind of think about here is the, is the notion of lying. Um, you know, if you tell lies when it's convenient for you to tell lies, then it's hard for people to believe when you're being honest that you're actually being honest. Um, and Kant points out this is this is true of any single con uh, um, conception that we can come up with. There's always a, a notion that it implies, and we have to think about if if we did this conception on a on a universal scale on a universal level, um, right? Would would it be possible for for the world to still exist with that notion? Um, if you remember on Heinz Dilemma, that was the one where the, the pharmacist is charging an outrageous amount of money um, for, for people to, to be cured. One way that we could approach this, and this is common in business ethics um, from a deontological perspective, is to say, well, what is the notion of, of the business to begin with? What is its purpose, right? What, what, what is its conception? And a lot of people, when they look at businesses, say, well, it's to make money. Right? The reason why a business exists is to make money. And um, that is one of the functions of a business, Kant would point out, but that's actually not its conception. Um, any business can make money, right? What, what makes a pharmacist different from a, uh, say, restaurant is the fact that it produces medication, medicine to help people. And so it, its purpose, its conception, is that it will it will help people by making making drugs making medicine that people need and um, if a pharmacy becomes uh, something other than that it becomes about making money first again it, it will need to make money in order to be able to function as a pharmacy right but when it changes that conception to it makes money by um, selling medicine to people 
um, it no longer functions as a as a as a pharmacy as as the conception it's conceived of. I um, mean, that's when you can start seeing a pharmacy start selling all sorts of other things and, and start becoming something other than a pharmacy. And you can say that's that's true of any business that exists. And in fact, you see, um, especially in in beginning uh, uh, startup companies. Um, you, they will change their conception very rapidly, and oftentimes um, that's what causes them to, to kind of fizzle out and die as new startups, is that instead of taking a stand for being a, a principled business, um, a business that um, right, isn't trying to just turn a profit in any which way it can, um, it ultimately has to, has to find a niche that it fulfills um, and, and stands on the market as, as that kind of principle. So again, um, that's the way that you could think of this in, in business ethics sorts of uh, terms. Um, but more importantly here is just the idea that notion uh, of, of goodness itself cannot contradict itself. Um, and that is a, a consistent part of, uh, of deontological ethics. Another idea behind this that I think is really important, we'll talk about closer to, to the end of uh, class here, is the idea that um, in order to think of a universal principle, um, in order to be able to think of a maximum, uh, you actually have to be a rational individual. That is, you, you have to be able to, to think of uh, on a universal scale, being able to do an action over and over again. And so if you can't do this, um, if you can't consider um, the universalizability um, of, a, of a principle, um, Kant would point out um, that means that you lack to some degree the rationality uh, that is required to make a moral decision. Again, we'll talk about why this is important um, a little bit later in class, but just in the back of your mind, keep that in mind that um, this requires uh, rationality to be able to determine the maximum in the first place. Um, last thing I would point out about this contradiction and conception test um, is that when, when you try to justify contradicting the universal maximum, um, that's ultimately from Kant's perspective what introduces evil into the world. Um, there's this old Bud Light commercial where this uh, guy and uh, girl are, are um, driving through the woods. Um, and you can see on, on the slides here kind of what that looks like. It's shot as this old horror film. Um, and the um, guy looks up and sees uh, this person with a, uh, with a chainsaw. And um, he uh, is like, I think we should pick him up. Um, and the woman in the car is like, that's crazy. No, like, let's not pick that person up. He's, he's got a chainsaw. And so the uh, guy drives the car over and sees that he has Bud Light. And he's like, hey, buddy, like, why do you have the chainsaw? Right. And the guy looks at him and he's like, it's a bottle opener. <laughs> um, and so... What Kant would point out is that, like, we ourselves can't read into other people's motivations. Um, and when we do, when we try to justify not doing the right thing, right, or not doing the right action because the situation seems bad to us, that's actually what allows us to introduce evil into the world to begin with. Um, you know, so when we decide that we're going to lie to somebody because it's easier than telling the truth, that's what allows evil to exist in the world. When we decide that we're going to cheat on somebody um, because, you know, it's it's pleasurable for us. That's what allows evil to exist in the world. And so anytime we contradict, outright contradict our own conceptions, that's when goodness um, starts to, to fade from the world. And that's when evil begins to take root. So... If we look back really quick here, again, there's four parts to the categorical imperative. The first one is that question about intention. Do, you, do I have the right intention? The second one is this contradiction and conception test, right, or this universalizability standard. Like, does this notion contradict itself? Can I repeatedly do it over and over again? In other words, is, is it universalizable? Those are the, the first two parts here. 
The third part is what's called the contradiction in will test or the formula of humanity. And what Kant says is this, always treat humanity, whether in your own person or that of another, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. In other words, in order to be able to do the right thing, I have to understand that people are trying to achieve their own ends um, and that I have to treat them as an end before I treat them as a means. Um, it's not to say that I can't choose somebody, uh, treat somebody as a means, but I have to, before I do, uh, consider their own ends and uh, be consistent about making sure they are able to meet their ends um, as, as well as uh, I am able to meet my, my own ends. If I place somebody below my own goals, then I've started to already introduce evil into the world. Um, this is one of the central kind of ideas in Les Miserables, if you've ever uh, seen that before, is, you know, there's this character, Jean, Jean Valjean, um, who um, is at the beginning uh, a, a criminal because he stole a loaf of bread for his family and has done this really long kind of sentence. And um, he's able to skip out on parole um, and um, no one really realizes what, what has happened. And he later kind of reproduces his life as a mayor of this town. Um, and um, there's this inspector, right, that's uh, uh, <laughs> Russell Crowe right there, who follows him throughout his life, trying to, to catch him doing the, the wrong sort of thing. Um, and what's interesting about this is that, uh, you know, the Russell Crowe uh, kind of figure, the inspector, um, is really this idea about people who, who think that they're, they're reinforcing justice by trying to find people, right, committing acts that they consider to be wrong. Um, and from a Kantian perspective, we should first regard people um, as rational decision makers. That is, we should give people the benefit of the doubt, even in extreme situations, um, about what their intentions are. Because if we undermine what other people's intentions are, if we undermine uh, them as an end of themselves, then we're undermining their humanity. And so along those same lines, um, Kant says something else. Ultimately says, um, right, that if I think of other people in terms of my, my goals, I'm ultimately negating their rationality. Um, and when I negate somebody's rationality, I negate their humanity. And so, um, you know, I can you know, walk down the street and see the homeless person. And if I, in some way, uh, think that I am better than that person um, because my circumstances are better, because um, the consequences of the actions that I've undertaken have, have placed me in a better position. Um, Kant would point out, then I've in some ways already introduced um, evil into the world by negating uh, another person's uh, life choices. Because it may very well be the case that somebody who we see um, uh, that uh, has had somewhat of a bad uh, moral luck, right, or as someone who's just, um, you know, fallen onto hard times, right, they've done that standing up for goodness. Um, and so, again, even if I think a person is much lower than myself, or even if I think I am very justified in being able to do something, when I start to believe that I can use other people for my own purposes, then I've, I've negated their rationality. And so the only person who can actually make a decision for their own lives is that person. And in fact, the only person who can make a decision for my own life is myself. And for uh, Kant, this is a key principle, is that our wills, right, what we will to do in our life cannot contradict itself and part of that uh, has to include the fact that we can't use people um, against their own will, 
against their, their own needs. So again, we have to think through these three particular scenarios. Right? Do I have the right intention? Does it contradict itself in any sort of way? Um, am I using the other person right, um, to justify my own ends? Or do I have their own ends in mind? And so if we think about this for a second, think about, for instance, um, that the homeless person I was just talking about. Right? What, what if I do see a person who is homeless on the street and I want to give them some money? And I start going through these tests, all right? What, what is my intention? We can think of a way in which that, that could be wrong, right? So maybe I want to give the homeless person some money so that everyone will stare at me and think that I'm the most amazing person in the world. And when I hand over the money, I'm like, oh, you dear person, here, let me give you some money from my wallet, all right? Um, that, that could be the wrong intention. But let's just assume that that's not what I'm doing, right? That I, I genuinely want to give money because I want to help the person. Well, then we can go to the second idea, right? Does, does it contradict itself in any sort of way? That is, if every person chose to do this, would, would it erode any sort of notion? And really, as you think about this, if, if everyone right, gave money to people who are homeless, maybe that would eradicate homelessness, right? But it, it certainly wouldn't do anything evil. It wouldn't uh, contradict any sort of universal notion. So it passes that test as well. And so we go to the third test, right? Does it undermine the other person's humanity in any sort of way? Am I using that person to achieve something? And again, um, this has a lot to do with our intentions, but let's, let's say that my intentions are good here, right? And I'm not wanting to use this person. And uh, furthermore, I'm giving them money because I, I genuinely want to help that person become a better individual. Okay, I've passed all three of those tests, right? I know that the right action here is for me to give the money, but how much money do I give? You say I've got $100 in my wallet, um, which has never been true in my life, <laughs> right? Let's say I do, right? Uh, how much of that $100 should I give? And this is where Kant uh, comes up with his last and, and fourth conception here that's really important uh, to talk about. Kant says that there's two types of duties that we have in our lives, um, what he calls perfect duties and what he calls imperfect duties. So per perfect duties are duties where our moral obligation is completely determined. We know exactly what we're supposed to do. It's, it's spelled out for us. Um, a while back, my parents asked me to help them move and I knew what, exactly what my duty was in that situation. <laughs> I was supposed to pick up all the heavy things and put them in a U-Haul, right, and, and help them move. Like, that's, that's my main moral obligation. Um, but this situation with the uh, homeless person is, is an imperfect duty. Um, right? we, we don't know how much of the $100, or in this case, that wallet looks really fat, <laughs> right, um, how much money we're, we're actually supposed to give, right? It's, uh, it's vague and undetermined. That's what an imperfect duty is. And so in this situation, um, Kant has a really interesting answer. Kant says that, in fact, if we think about morality itself, um, rational individuals don't really need um, this categorical imperative to begin with because rational individuals can think through all these different steps. Um, and so even, even though he says morality is, is kind of bound to this, this categorical imperative, he points out the fact that as rational individuals, we are perfectly capable of determining all of these ideas for ourselves. And moreover, we are capable of determining what is the proper need for other individuals versus our own obligations. He says each person is subject and author, an author sorry, of their moral principles because they can rationally decide what is the best course of action for themselves. So as you have that hundred dollars in your wallet, um, and let's say you know you're heading for the grocery store, you're the person who knows what your obligations are as as say uh, you know for me a father, right? I know what I have to pick up from the grocery store to feed my children, and what will be left over from that that I could give to to this homeless person. 
um, I know my obligations as a, as a husband, as a worker, things along those lines. And so I'm able to determine from that what is um, my the extent of my moral duty. And in fact, this idea about the kingdom of ends, um, of us being able to determine in a lot of situations where our duty isn't spelled out for us, again, it's an imperfect duty, we're, we're able to more or less figure out what it is that we're supposed to do, um, what would be uh, the fulfillment of our moral obligations, because we're rational individuals. We can think for ourselves. And so if we go back to this one last time here, right, um, the full extent of the categorical imperative, again, what is required of us as human beings in order to fulfill our obligations of being human beings um, are these four standards. I have to have the right intention. I cannot contradict the notion of goodness in any sort of way, right? My actions have to be universalizable. Um, I cannot contradict the will of other people. Um, I have to have other people's ends in mind, not just my own ends. And as a rational human being, I can decide how best to fulfill my duties. Um, I can I can choose for myself um, how to how to meet my ends. In looking at this, I want to point out that there are a number of, of issues that people have uh, with deontology. Um, so, you know, probably the biggest issue here is what about the times when our when our duties still conflict with each other? Obviously, um, there are times when we have obligations that we have to meet that are um, contradictory in some sort of ways, right? Um, if I have duties as a uh, you know professor and duties as a father, um, I have to decide well which one of those takes precedence, right? Should I go see my <laughs> kids ball game um, when I know that I'm supposed to be holding office hours. Um, there could be conflicts as far as you know, my duties as a husband and my duties as a father. Um, I'm sure as you sit back and think about this, there's probably a number of ways that you can probably in, in your own life see that there can be a, a conflict of, of, of moral obligations, moral duties. Um, Probably the biggest critique that people have of deontology is its optimistic view about rationalism. Um, in fact, if we take the, the larger view that Kant has, um, Kant thinks that what makes human beings different than animals, um, why he, he holds um, human beings to a different standard than he holds animals, um, is based off of rationality. Uh, Kant thinks, for instance, that there, there is no problem with, with being um, a, a carnivore, right, with eating meat or, or things like that, um, because uh, ultimately, uh, from his perspective, uh, human beings as more rational individuals are, are able to use less rational animals to fulfill their, their dietary purposes. Um, and there's a lot of crazy kind of scenarios where Kant would point out that we should believe in the rationality of other individuals. Um, so probably the most famous example is, you know, if a serial killer shows up at your house with an ax and, you know, knocks on the door and asks where your family members are, uh, Kant takes this kind of extreme uh, stance that like we, we ought not to lie to the serial killer. It doesn't mean that we have to tell them where our family members are, but we shouldn't lie to them and, and say that, you know, we, we don't have our family members there. Um, if the Gestapo comes knocking on your door asking, you know, are you hiding Jews in your uh, attic, right, in your in 1940s Germany hiding Anne Frank, um, right, Kant would say, like, you should not lie to the Gestapo. Doesn't mean that you have to tell them the truth, but um, you shouldn't lie. Um, you shouldn't introduce that type of evil into the world. And so people who criticize deontology would say, you know, that sounds, that sounds just a little too optimistic um, about other people's rationality. And there seems like there, there are times, even when people are rationalistic, where we should 
we should not regard uh, their their decision making capabilities right as superior to or equal to our, our own. And um, the last thing I'd say here is the question about well, what about people who aren't rational? People who we know act in irrational sorts of manners. And um, this is kind of like with Aristotle, not Kant's greatest place, um, not his greatest wheelhouse. Uh, in fact, um, Kant has a very specific view um, of what people um, or who it is that's the most rational individuals. And I'm sure you can probably guess, right, based off of the historical context, who he considers to be rational individuals. And in fact, it's probably worse than what you're thinking, um, because um, aside from half of humanity, he also considers that um, people of European descent, specifically Germans, um, are, are the most rational individuals. What I would point out, however, um, going back to this notion of rationality, is that after um, Kant comes up with this uh, idea of, of morality, we start seeing a new argument that's being made in courts. Um, and in fact, it's the basis that we have for the insanity plea. And basically the argument that people start making in court is just simply this. Um, if you're not able to understand rationally um, what the consequences of your actions are going to be, um, if you can't understand this kind of universalizable principle that if everyone were to do the same thing that you were doing, right, there would be no, no goodness left, um, then you can't really be held responsible for your actions because you don't have the rational capability of understanding the consequences of your actions. And so interestingly enough, um, this argument that is used to detach morality from the results of an action is the same argument that is used um, to evaluate whether or not people should be punished um, based off of an action. And in fact, even today, um, you will see that a lot of people um, who have arguments against things like capital punishment um, draw on deontological ethics and point out that um, something like capital punishment uh, you know, is this contradiction in, in will. We're, we're treating people exactly in a manner consistent with which we say people should not be treated. Right? We say, like, it's wrong for you to, to murder somebody, so let's murder you if you do. Um, right? But the idea um, behind it is, like, goodness itself cannot be contradictory. And so if the action is wrong for one person, then it's also wrong for the state to enact that same kind of punishment. Um, in thinking about that, I want to turn towards your assignment for, for this week, which is watching the episode of Black Mirror. And I think if you take a, an honest look at this episode, um, again, it's, it's the White Bear episode, I, I think you will be very interested in, in seeing how this particular principle plays out. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you on Wednesday.